little bit on that history. That history, the, the way that that evolved was that there was a price freeze after World War II. And the employers wanted to attract right. employees. Mm -hmm. And they gave that credit, that benefit. The other piece of that that you got to keep in mind is that every one of those dollars that are spent on health care are pre-tax. So every dollar that an employee gets as health care is a 30% about discount per dollar. An individual doesn't get that. So when we talk about this, there's a huge tax break that goes to people that get employee insurance through their employers. It's about $180 billion a year at the federal level. It's a big number. So when I hear people talking about it's expensive for employers, I understand that. It's yeah. very expensive for all of us. It's just that we don't see the cost. So if we want to fix it, really fix it, that's one of the ideas behind putting box DD on your W-2 if, you have an employee, if you're an employee. Box DD tells you what your employer is paying for your insurance. All of that is pre-tax, every dime. So it's nothing for somebody to have that as 10 or 15 or $20,000 a year, pre-tax. No tax. Yeah. Zero. Not. Not everybody gets that. Yeah. And that's where some of the idea behind the Affordable Care Act was designed to try to level that playing field. The reality is it's really expensive and nobody wants to pay for it. Yeah. 50 million people don't have any health insurance. And we are arguing about whether we should pay too much for what we pay. They have none. And the idea was that everybody gets some. So the idea behind affordable care was, we want to have everybody have an opportunity to have insurance. And it is the That's the idea. Now, if we don't want to pay for that, and we think we should have it, but they shouldn't, we need to rationalize that in our minds. Good discussion. You know, we've now been joined by the Plymouth City Manager. Is that your title? Administrative Services. Administrative Services. Lori Aaron's City Manager. Sorry, sorry. Um, any questions? Do you want to talk about 494? What, any? Mm -hmm. We uh, testified together uh, on our 494 bill. Well, we're still looking for a solution, a long-term solution for 494. Yeah. We recently received a proposal for MnDOT to put in a temporary shoulder lane for peak hours, and while that's great, and we get a, we get some sort of relief, it's not the permanent solution because that interim solution could be 15 or 20 years. So uh, we're still continuing and look at some efforts in Senator Bond office to introduce a bill that would provide some funding for putting that permanent lane, the third lane in the <coughs> It's the only one on the whole beltway that's, that's right. two lanes now. And it causes problems for the whole Northwest mm -hmm. metro area. It causes people to get off on 55 and go through uh, Vicksburg and other north-south um, streets. So it does cause problems for our community. So we're certainly looking for some solutions and we're still um, doing that. Next week there's a house companion bill to yours right. that will be, uh, the mayor will be testifying next Wednesday on that. So we're continuing to look at look for some solutions and some relief. And we just we just want to be treated fairly with the regional transportation system. And right now if there's, if there's a gaping hole there, um, two, two lanes to three lanes and three lanes to two lanes, and that whole area just does not make sense. <coughs> and you know they never in a transportation committee you don't they're never going to say oh we'll give you a lane so what I tried to do <coughs> even though you put forward a bill like that they'll never that's just not how we do our road building nor would you want them to I mean can you imagine if every senator is like I want this stop sign I want you know it'd be a nightmare but I felt by raising it in that way that the transportation committee ought to look long term is it smart to do this dynamic shoulder when it's so short-sighted when what we really need is the third lane because are you being penny wise pound foolish if you do something that lasts even 15 years when you could do something that would last 100 years and that would really change the whole the problem is sure it could even last a little bit of time but they're expecting huge growth still in this area and so as our businesses expand, we really want to be poised to be able to not just take that expansion, but have people want to continue coming out this way. Yes. I think that uh, the pound... Pennywise yeah, pound there foolish. You go, that, yes. Yeah, that was the one point I was going to tell you at some point in the email, because I think that however long it's going to last, I don't know what the incremental cost, I don't know what they, 
the normal road, but they're already fixing the shoulder. They're making it wider. And I think that lane will be abused. Yeah. If it's stoplights above it that say don't drive in here now, but they know it's not really a shoulder technically, they're going to use it's going to be abused. Seems a mess. Wait, and I happen. think part of what I read though too, and I don't know if this will be offend any of you here. I don't mean it personally, but they talked about walls. I have a problem paying for walls. Developers and homeowners, there's not a one along that stretch of road that was there when that freeway was built. That's not my issue. If you decide to develop or buy a home there. I don't like driving through the wall. It's different in South Minneapolis. Those homes all existed there when the freeway came through. This should be up to the developer to make a mound or whatever when you're building by a freeway. Not my cost. Put that money into the lane. And you know, actually, we, there's a law that's very clear about decibels and um, and I because I've had constituents who have complained and said there should be a wall here and and I've called Mint out and they come out and they listen and they measure and they have equipment and so. Um, it's a data-driven process to decide where a wall comes and where it doesn't, and it has, you know, there's health impact, and, but I hear you. Right, but why, is that, why should that be when the noise was there before you bought the stupid house in the first I place? I hear you. Well, and it does have to have a certain amount of density as part of the formula. Stupid. So another thing I wanted to bring up, um, and you guys mentioned it, is the Hollydale issue. So I know you two are affected. Anybody else in here affected by the potential Hollydale? Okay, good, good. Um, I so, think I might be. I can't figure it out. Well, <laughs> and you proposal. wouldn't be able to figure right. it out because there's like eight proposals of routes. Yeah. I'm not sure what you're talking about there. Well, then. Uh, so um, there's a section. There's a section on the western part of Clement that um, XL has identified as they want to upgrade this section of uh, power line, transmission lines with. Um, increased transmission capacity and so they have said that for this area they want to take the brown poles that are in people's backyards and they want to put in those big 115k voltage lines and the reason and they have said that the reason why isn't because um, there isn't enough power going through it's because that um, they need more distribution more of the power that's as to the north of here, as things have grown and expanded, they need more distribution of the power that goes through. So I'm trying to explain there's a distinction between a transmission problem where they don't have enough poles and a distribution problem. And they've said it's really a distribution problem, but they've identified a transmission solution. David? I was just going to add that they're adding a substation too. That's yes. a big part of that right. whole equation. But the substation actually could be the most wonderful thing because one of the proposals, if you go through and you read all the various options that have been proposed, one of the proposals is to connect to the substation with two smaller distribution lines so that you wouldn't have to do the big transmission fault. So to make a long story short, I've been fighting with this ever since I learned about it in June when I was door knocking with Sean and, and we were knocking door after door after door and that's all anybody was talking about and so I feel like that um, Aaron Brockovich, <laughs> say, say it for me, Brockovich, thank you, um, where I'm like, okay, PUC, here we come. And so we've gone to these PUC meetings, we've protested, we're, we've actually, and not just us, but your neighborhood is so organized and so powerful in the way they've come together and they've hired an attorney part of this group has hired the Western Neighborhood Alliance has hired an attorney there's another group who's not part of that that's a little more to the east they're worried they're left out but I'm fighting for both sides so it's okay <laughs> um, but anyways so together we got the PUC to change from saying it was going to be an uncontested certificate of need so there's two parts. First, you have to show that you have this need. And the second part is, what route are you gonna do? And they were gonna say, the route could be a contested hearing because they knew there'd be a lot of arguments, but they were gonna just slide through the certificate of need because there's a provision that says, <coughs> if your stretch that you're putting this thing in is greater than 10, you have to have a certificate of need. Well, various routes said the stretch would be, Area said that wouldn't be, so it wasn't clearly demanded by law.